prepare our hearts and also to pray as the ministers do answer. Well, good morning, everybody. And happy Sabbath to you all. Today, we're continuing with our series on the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And this morning, we are looking at topic number 24 out of our 28. And uh, this is related to Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And sometimes we refer to it as the investigative judgment. And what I would like to do to begin is simply read for you the official church statement on our belief. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of this belief, um, touch on some controversies related to this belief, and then look at some of the basic um, elements that make up this belief as we read from the Bible. So first, let's take a look at our uh, church statement. There is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle, which the Lord set up, and not man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of His atoning sacrifice, offered once for all on the cross. He was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry at the time of his ascension. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry. It is a work of investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. In that typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things are purified with the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. The investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences who among the dead are asleep in, Jesus, in Christ and therefore in Him are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. It also makes manifest who, among the living, are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and in Him, and therefore ready for translation into His everlasting kingdom. This judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. The completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. This is probably one of the longest <laughs> and most complex statements related to our beliefs, and we'll talk a little bit about some of its elements a little later on. First, I'd like to uh, briefly review a little of the history of this belief and how it came to be included in our fundamental beliefs. When Jesus did not return as expected in 1844, the Millerite movement, an event which we call the Great Disappointment took place. Following this event, uh, people were questioning what had happened and, and why Jesus had not returned. And various ideas and various theories were put forward 
including re-examining the date and setting it another year later or another season later. About the time of this great disappointment, um, one man had a vision in a cornfield, and in this vision he was shown a scene of heaven with Christ entering into the most holy place. And Hiram Edson, who had this vision, uh, shared this with some of the other early uh, believers in the Millerite movement. And they began to study the Bible more diligently and carefully. And they came to the conclusion that the date of 1844, as marked by prophecy, did not signify the return of Christ, but instead a change of his ministry. In the early years of Adventism, there was some dispute over this, um, and there were various variations on this. Uh, there, was some, there were some people who thought that Jesus would still come very soon, and they thought that this ministry was a, what we called the closed door. From 1844, no one else could be saved. Jesus was coming soon. We had entered the period of probation. But of course, as the years went by, <laughs> after two or three years and Jesus did not return, uh, these people, or this idea was realized not to be accurate. And by the, 18, the late 1850s, uh, the, the earliest formulation of this belief had come to be. And Ellen, not Ellen, and James White, writing in the Review and Herald in uh, 1857, described the process as the investigative judgment taking place in heaven, in which the lives of professed believers would pass and review before God. And this was the first time that this phrase, investigative judgment, was used by the uh, Adventist leadership, and of course is still used today. Uh, Ellen White, in Great Controversy, um, talked a great deal about the work of Christ in the sanctuary. In chapter 28 of the Great Controversy, she devotes a whole chapter to discussing uh, this work and describing um, the biblical verses which are related to the work that Christ was doing and the judgment that had now begun. As I mentioned, there was not um, a uniform interpretation of this um, belief initially, and uh, even as late as 1880, uh, which was about 30 years after the first belief was formulated, there were still some early church leaders who uh, were at odds over some of the aspects of this belief. In the years that followed, as Adventist um, pastors uh, began to attend secular universities in pursuit of PhDs uh, and were affected by the scholarship of the non-Adventist world, some of these pastors began to question some aspects of this belief um, related to textual criticism rather than a biblical-based proof text approach to the study of this particular belief. And between the 1830s, or not 1830s, 1930s, uh, till actually about uh, 30 years ago, there have been a number of Adventist uh, pastors or theologians who have sometimes come out with varying interpretations related to Christ's work in the Holy Sanctuary. When I was a freshman at PUC in 1979, one of the professors there was the name of Desmond Ford. And uh, he, at the urging of some of his colleagues, 
uh, presented a view on the sanctuary which was not exactly um, the same as what we've traditionally held it to be. And this led to a considerable amount of controversy in the Adventist Church. And there was a great conference or meeting held in Colorado, in Glacier View, where leaders from all over the Adventist Church, theologians, pastors, gathered for a week of meetings and discussions about the implications of what uh, Desmond Ford had put forward. And at the conclusion of this, uh, the church decided to maintain its basic position on the ministry of Christ. Some of the differences that Desmond Ford put forward were related to the time elements of the prophecies in Daniel. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at the specific elements of the belief. But um, many of the people who challenged the idea of the investigative judgment also had other questions about Adventist theology and Adventist belief. And most of these people eventually left the church, and some of them became quite strong critics of Adventism. The basics, basic elements that I'd like to look at this morning related to our belief in Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary start off, first of all, with the Day of Atonement. And we read about this, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, in the Book of the Priest, it outlines the ceremonies that are to take place on that day. The Day of Atonement was held in the seventh month, on the tenth day, and it was the final religious uh, festival in the Jewish calendar. The Jewish religious calendar was only seven months long. Um, the first month started with Passover, the seventh month ended with the Day of Atonement being celebrated. The Day of Atonement was a day of repentance, a day of seeking uh, forgiveness from your family, your friends, and your neighbors, a day to be spent in prayer. And uh, even today, this is the most uh, sacred of Jewish holidays. It's called Yom Kippur today. And over the centuries, the Jews added other restrictions of fasting, um, not bathing, not wearing certain kinds of clothes. And um, But from what we read in, in Leviticus, the Day of Atonement was a day at which the priest, the high priest, made sacrifices to atone for the sins of the nation and also to make sacrifices to cleanse the temple of the sins that had accumulated there during the year. The high priest would, of course, offer sacrifices for himself. They would draw lots for two goats. One goat was a goat of sacrifice. The other was the was called a zale, who was a symbol of Satan. This goat was driven out of the camp and left to die in the desert. Later on, this was changed to being pushed over a cliff. The goat, the other goat, was a symbol of Satan, upon which all the sins were sent away from the community. And as part of this, the high priest would ceremonially clean the holy place and the most holy place. This was the only day of the year that the high priest would enter the most holy place. Other, the other 364 days, uh, the most holy place was off limits. And in fact, the high priest if he was not fully purified, he would die if he entered into the most holy place. And this actually did happen on a couple of occasions, and so the Jews had a tradition of tying a rope 
around the right angle <laughs> of the high priest as he entered the most holy place. If he did die, they could drag him out without anyone else going in. This Day of Atonement, as we said, was a symbolic cleansing of the temple and a symbolic cleansing of the nation as a whole and the people as a whole. And so this was a ceremony which was instituted while the people were in the desert and it was something that was continued all the way down until the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. And of course is still practiced today by Jews at Yom Kippur. Now, as with all of the ceremonies and all of the sacrifices, these things were symbols to, to teach and to remind the people about the Messiah and the sacrifice that he would make. And this is something that, um, of course, Paul talks about a great deal in Romans, or not Romans, in Hebrews, chapters 8 and chapters 9. We read some of those verses in the scripture and prayer, and also as part of the responsive reading. Paul talks about Christ as our high priest, superior to the human priests who had to use animal blood to make atonement. In the case of Christ, he, in his blood, made atonement once and for all for us and for the sanctuary. It did not have to be done on a... He, did, he only had to die once. Paul talks a little more about the, the necessity of this sacrifice in Romans, where he compares Adam and Christ just as Adam sinned once to bring sin into the world for all men, Christ's one sacrifice brought life and forgiveness and reconciliation to all men. Now, in the book of Daniel, we are shown a vision, or several visions, and in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel was shown the vision of the future of different kingdoms, and there was an interlude in the vision of the kingdoms that he was being shown in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and verse 10. Daniel was shown a scene of heaven. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from behind him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Here, Daniel was shown a scene of a courtroom, a courtroom scene, a scene of judgment. And from this, we know, of course, that judgment is going on in heaven. The placement of this scene is while the other prophecies are still being fulfilled. This is not a scene of the final judgment that Daniel is being shown. It's a scene of an ongoing judgment that is taking place in heaven in the final period of Earth's history. And we understand that as we continue reading. If you read down through verses 11 and 12, Then I continued to watch because the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other priests had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. 
In my vision I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of, Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So here in chapter 7, we are shown this courtroom image. And then Daniel is shown that time continues and the, the final beast of his vision of the four beasts, the dragon, uh, was finally destroyed and thrown into the fire, and Christ returned. And so this courtroom scene that we see is before the return, the second coming of Christ. Now, Daniel did not understand what this vision was about completely, and in chapters uh, 8 and in chapters 9 of Daniel, uh, more information is given about the vision. In Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, we have the very famous passage telling us about the timing. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifices, the rebellion that causes destruction, and the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings till the sanctuary will be reconstructed. And in chapter 9, the following chapter, more details and explanation are given about this. If you turn to Matthew, or not Matthew, Daniel 9, chapters 24, or verses 24 through 27, we have a very famous passage where Daniel was told that 77s would be given for his people, or 490 years, and after that time, the anointed one would come. And so... We, from this, we know that the Messiah would come 490 years from the beginning of this prophecy. The prophecy is said to start from the sending out of an order to rebuild the temple. And if we study history, we find that this can be dated to four 57 B.C., when Artaxerxes issued the decree authorizing the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, if we do the math from 457, if we go 490 years, it brings us down to the beginning of Christ's ministry in 27 uh, A.D., and the one week it says in the prophecy he will be cut off in half a week, three and a half years, which was the length of Christ's ministry on earth. But the prophecy continued for another three and a half years, down to about 34 AD, which ended with the stoning of Stephen and the ministry of Paul as the apostle to the Gentile world. And so... This 2300 days, the first 490 years section, gave us an idea of when the Messiah would come and when the, the Jewish nation would have its final opportunity to accept and follow the truth. And of course, if we extend the prophecy down 2300 years, a day for a year, we end up with 1844. And so we believe that the beginning of this special work that Christ would do is dated to 1844. As we mentioned, uh, when William Miller and others were studying the Bible, they misunderstood this to mean that Christ would come in 1844. 
And for a period of about, oh, about 20 years, 20, 25 years, William Miller preached that Jesus was coming again in the fall of 1843-1844. And the Millerite movement rapidly spread across North America and even into Europe and other countries beyond. Of course, Jesus did not come, and that is when um, this was reinterpreted by Adonis in light of the vision that was shown to Hiram Edison. Now, the work of Christ, as we understand from Hebrews, is a continuation of the shadow or the type, the symbols that was done by the earthly high priest. And Paul talks a great deal about this. Um, in his book of Hebrews, he talks about Christ and his relationship to God, the angels, and as our high priest, explaining to the Jewish world, the Jewish reader, that Christ was qualified to be our high priest. He was not of the family of Aaron, but of the order of Melchizedek. Um, in, as Melchizedek was not from the family of Aaron, he was a priest that had worked uh, and served God, and uh, whom Abraham had paid tithes to and given offerings to. Christ was of that order of priesthood. He was not a descendant of Aaron. And yet, because of his sacrifice, he could present his blood in place of the blood of the animals, and he could serve in the same manner as the priest. The priest, on a daily basis, had gone in presenting the incense as a symbol of prayer. They had submitted the blood as a symbol of sacrifice for forgiveness and for repentance. And Christ, uh, who those things all were symbols for, carried these out himself directly before the Father in heaven. And as the Bible tells us, the sanctuary in heaven is a model upon which the sanctuary on earth was based. There are some Christians today who do not believe in a literal sanctuary in heaven, but as we've read and talked about in these verses, it says very clearly, a sanctuary, a tabernacle not made by human hands. Now, what exactly is involved in this second and final stage of Christ's ministry? As Adventists, we believe that this judgment, what we call the investigative judgment, is a judgment of those who are righteous, starting first with those who have died, and progressing through the centuries down to those who are alive. And the Bible in many places talks about the judgment. Um, we, as we read in Daniel, the books were open. In Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon talks about how every deed will be revealed at the time of judgment. And we are told we will be judged according to our works. Throughout the Bible, there are many, many references to judgment. And it is only uh, logical <laughs> that the righteous would need to be judged before Jesus could return. How would we know who would be fit for resurrection? How would we know who would be fit for translation unless their lives and deeds were examined and cleared? We know that the investigative judgment also is a, a forum which the whole universe can watch and see. God's process is one which is transparent. There is nothing secret or hidden from the, the angels, the people from other worlds. 
they all are watching and seeing how God reviews each of the cases of the righteous. And of course, we have a very famous example of that in the story of Job. Job was judged. He was challenged by Satan before God. And, of course, he had to go through some trials as part of way of demonstrating God knew, <laughs> God knew that, jo that Job was a righteous man, but he needed to demonstrate to others that this was so. And in the same way, God knows who is righteous and who is not. The judgment, the investigative judgment is not so much for God's direct benefit as it is for the benefit of us and for the rest of creation to see that God is being just and fair in dealing with each of our cases. In Revelation chapters 20, verses 11 and 12, we see another scene in heaven related to this. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The, judge, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Here we are shown another scene of this investigative judgment, the judgment of the righteous dead. And in the following chapter, we see the, the, the timing and sequence of this in Revelation chapter 22, verses 11 and 12. There is an announcement made just before Christ is set to return. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right, and let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give everyone according to what he has done. From these verses, we can clearly see that at the, the close of the investigative judgment, there will be no more opportunities for people to change their position or their view. All will be fixed with the close of what we call probation. And as we uh, read in Revelation elsewhere, and also in Ellen White's writings, a period of time will pass between the close of probation and Christ's return. But during that time, it will be like it was in the time of Noah. The door was shut and a week passed before the flood came. Now, sometimes people say, well, why do we really need to have this belief and what, what's its relevance or importance for us as Christians and as Adventists? And I think, as in the case of Job, um, the judgment is a chance to show vindication, to show that we are worthy to be saved. It is God and Christ as our intercessor, demonstrating that we have accepted the forgiveness and accepted the righteousness that He freely offers, and that that has covered our imperfections and our evil deeds. Now, of course, that does not give us license to go on sinning. <laughs> Paul talks about this quite a bit in Romans that God's grace and God's forgiveness is not a license to simply do whatever we want. We can't just go on living the same way and then pray for forgiveness. Oh, God, forgive me. I was a bad boy today, and I'm going to be bad again tomorrow. <laughs> that is not what the Christian walk is all about. 
God expects us to improve ourselves, to change ourselves. Part of the process of repentance is change. If there is no change, you are not truly repentant. And so, we do need to make our best effort. We do need to look at our lives and examine and find those things which we need to remove or improve or to polish if we are going to be found acceptable in God's sight. We are covered by God's grace and by God's forgiveness, but we are judged according to our actions. Actions speak louder than words. And so it is very important for us each and every day to walk in Jesus' footsteps and hold fast to His commandments. As we talked about earlier, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And if we truly love someone, we will do and act in ways that make them happy. If I say I love my girlfriend, but I never do anything for her, <laughs> people are going to question whether I truly love her or not. If I tell her I, I love you, but I forget her birthday, or uh, don't give her any flowers on Valentine's Day, or maybe White Day in Japan, uh, people are going to question, do you really love this person like you claim? And if we say that we love God, if we claim to be His children, then we need to live and walk in His image each day. And if this is the way that we are living, then the investigative judgment is something we can look forward to. Because, as Job said, you know, I, I look forward to judgment. I want my name to be cleared. In the ancient Hebrew court system, it was much different than it is today. In Western law, the idea is you are innocent until proven guilty. But in ancient times, it was the opposite. You were guilty until proven innocent. If you did not have your day in court, you were condemned, and you would be executed or punished. Without a day in court, you could not clear your name. You could not be uh, found to be right with the law. And so people looked forward to a day in court because it gave them the opportunity to escape the condemnation and the punishment which they otherwise would be subjected. And so as Adventists, we should not fear the investigative judgment. We should look forward to the opportunity for our names to be cleared. But we can only have that attitude if we are living in harmony with Christ each day. And if we are living and walking with Christ, then He will help us to improve ourselves little by little each day. He will reveal to us the changes that we need to make and we can become more like him. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It would uh, do well to have a personal understanding of these uh, topics that Mark talked about today. If we could um, turn to our hymnals for number 520 for our closing hymn. 520.